My name is Aurora Elms and um, I'll be moderating today's session. And the Mental Health Deep Dive project that we're speaking about today was a collaborative project between CSI Swinburne, UNSW and UWA. So I'd like, also like to start by acknowledging and paying our respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which CSI works, including the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the Betagal and Gadigal people, both of the Eora Nation, the Ngunnawal people and the Wajuk Noongar people. We pay respects to these peoples and lands, to elders past and present, and acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. And as Rhonda said, if you'd like to say hello and acknowledge the country you're joining from, please feel free to do this in the chat. We'd also like to acknowledge the individual and collective expertise of people with living or lived experience of mental health, alcohol and other drug issues, and recognise their courage and vital contribution to learning and growing together to achieve better outcomes for all. And finally, we'd like to thank the we'd like to thank Zurich Financial Services Australia and the Z Zurich Foundation for their support of the Mental Health Deep Dive project. So just to briefly introduce myself, I'm a research fellow at the Centre for Social Impact Swinburne, and I've spent the past nine years researching mental health and well-being in a range of contexts, including workplace settings in social enterprise, in healthcare and community contexts. I'm interested in the intersection of social justice and health and how systems and organisations can support people's rights, life opportunities and well-being. So thank you all for joining us um, today. And uh, as I said, our webinar today is focused on the mental health deep dive research that forms part of Centre for Social Impact's Building Back Better project um, and was supported by Zurich Financial Services Australia and the Zed Zurich Foundation. And this is the first deep dive in our Building Back Better series. Our four part research report, which was launched in October 2021, examines how mental health and well-being is faring in Australia and finds that current funding models for youth mental health services across Australia have untapped potential in improving issues like staff burnout, high costs and disrupted service provision to young people in need. So first up today, we'll hear from one of our research team members, Lizette Calavelle, to take you through the findings from the mental health deep dive research. Then we'll introduce our panel members and put some questions to them for a panel discussion on young people's mental health. And finally, we'll finish up with a Q&A session that will draw on questions from the audience. So this will be your chance to put further questions to our panel members about the mental health deep dive research or the topic of youth, youth mental health. So please feel free to pop your questions in the chat as we go and Rhonda will keep track of these and share them with me for our Q&A section. So I'll now introduce our first speaker, Lizette Calaveld. Lizette is a research officer at the Centre for Social Impact UWA, and Lizette's evaluation experience spans the arts se sector, education, health and mental oh, sorry. health. And she's interested in writing, communicating and translating research into practice and meaning for, meaningful outcomes for people. I'll hand over to Lizette now to talk about the mental health deep dive research. Thank you, Aurora. Um, thanks everyone for being here and also to Zurich for providing this opportunity to explore. Um, I've been working in mental health for 10 years and it was amazing to have the time and space and reflection um, to uncover new insights, which you know, I kind of had a new angle on after doing this research. So um, because we wanted to make the most of this opportunity, we thought let's look right across the strategic context of mental health in Australia and um, look at where there's the issues and the gaps. Um, and we did this by looking at policy frameworks across all states and territories, and some of the really key um, documentation at the moment, such as the Victorian Royal Commission and the Productivity Commission report. Um, and so we really brought together um, all those documents and you know, decide, like worked out what the key themes and um, problems were that were identified. So this was using a sort of design thinking model where you sort of do divergent thinking um, and then you start to converge in on the key problems that you want to address. So after this, um, oh, just before I go any further, we also want to acknowledge that we looked at mental health um, with a really broad lens, um, looking at how it affects the whole population, really. So um, we know that everyone benefits from health promotion environments. And we also know that, you know, you can have mental health symptoms or a condition, but also well-being interacts with that. For example, you can have a mental health condition, but high well-being, or you can be free of any diagnosed 
mental health condition, but also have low well-being. And so really um, the mental health system, we think, should support the whole population and address all of the needs right across like primary prevention, which um, aims to prevent mental health conditions for everyone, um, secondary prevention, which looks at early access to help and to prevent the further um, acute conditions, and then obviously tertiary prevention, which is what we sometimes associate with the mental health system, um, which is about when you're in crisis and reducing the impact. So what did we find from looking at the frameworks? We found the Australia has a mental health system that has a good design and the architecture is there to address all of these needs across the population. We have prevention and promotion that encourages self-care, social care. We have models that support people early in life and early in episode. We have um, primary and secondary care and obviously we have the highly specialised um, tertiary care. Um, however, we do find that there's still a lot of problems preventing this system from working optimally. Um, for example, the people who are really well positioned to give support early, such as police and teachers, people in the workplaces, do not really have much training. Um, we also found that um, the people who are most at risk and really vulnerable to mental health issues are find it most difficult to find accessible support that is safe for them. Um, the system's difficult to navigate. It's hard to jump in at the right point according to your needs at the right time. And also to flow between this, these different levels of support and have that coordinated care. And then we also know that clinical supports, they may solve the problem, but then um, people might fall off a cliff and they're not supported after the care to rebuild their lives. And so people are just cycling through the system. That's a really brief summary of all the documents and frameworks, but there are common themes and this is what is emerging quite strongly. So what we did then using the design thinking approach is transform that into need statements. So actually trying to find the problems. Um, and we did this um, with a focus on young people because Zurich had indicated that that was an, an interest for them and also it makes sense. And also people experiencing social inequalities. So there are two groups that we really wanted to target. So we know that care is fragmented and not coordinated well. And the way to address that is more holistic mental health care. Um, and more choices. Wherever people uh, jump into the system, um, they should be allowed to, like their needs should be understood and they can move freely through different levels of care. And we know that there is increasing spending in mental health care, but it's not working. It doesn't seem to be um, producing outcomes. So what the literature said, or the grey literature says, is that we need more effective prevention and early intervention and we need to bring in people with lived experience um, and to develop models together and focus on connection. Um, people are waiting to be in crisis before they access care, and we know that does not work. Um, so we need, need more low threshold, easy to access care, and that can address people's needs right at that point and multiple needs that they have. Um, and we also know that social inequalities are exacerbated because the people who need the most support don't get the support. So we need to really understand the barriers and reduce them actively. So the next step is that we looked at the literature around what does promising and effective practice for young people um, mean? Where is the evidence? And what do we know based on the academic literature? Um, and the key points that we looked for was what targets reduction in mental health systems, but also promotes good mental health while addressing the social determinants of mental health and improve that early help seeking um, behavior, which is going to be most effective. So we saw that many studies um, looked at the secondary prevention approaches 
um, at the early stage of distress. But we also realised that some of this evidence base is still developing, um, and especially with young people uh, facing low socioeconomic disadvantage, um, we don't know enough. So we took um, some questions out to people who we selected for their experience in mental health, um, high level stakeholders who you know, knew their stuff. And we had some key questions which were informed by the literature review. Again, we used some design thinking techniques. So we asked participants to sort of really imagine what good care would be and what they would feel and how it would look and some kind of quite visceral questions to really explore. So the findings um, were quite clear across all of the discussions. We, we saw the same themes and these were people who worked in the youth sector and the mental health sector around young people. And they sort of had this understanding of young people as quite a, you know, a different cohort that needed a, a special approach. So we have to get better at engaging young people, especially people experiencing disadvantage, because they're currently not seeking out mental health support. And we need to go to where they are at. Um, we need individualized supports, um, universal supports that are non-stigmatizing, um, that just are for everybody. We don't need wait lists um, and we don't need you know, this model where people have to go and find a service and somehow get there on their own. So services need to be really flexible about reaching young people. Um, when the young people do find the service, we also um, need that service to be very authentic and have a meaningful connection with the young person. So have that time to develop really strong relationships and develop trust. Um, maybe a peer workforce would help enable that. Um, so young people need a chance for it to feel really like they have the care and understanding and non-stigmatizing approaches. Also, young people are often in a transition phase and there's a whole lot going on in their life as you make that really difficult transition, especially from childhood to adulthood. So you can't just pretend that mental health is their only need. And there would be a lot going on potentially, such as financial, housing, um, jobs, issues with you know, finding their way in the world. So um, service hubs were um, found to be pretty effective in co-locating of services and just people who work in mental health being really aware of what else is out there to address the multiple needs. And finally, empowering approaches that are really give young people the choice and the agency to, to choose the care they need at the time they need it, to drop in and out as they want and to feel really safe. Um, but what I found as the final point um, was quite interesting from really talking with the stakeholders was the way that the funding models and commissioning practices seem to um, prevent some of this best practice from happening. So it's not that people don't know what young people need, but it's just that in their everyday practice, they are bound by quite constraining models, perhaps, where they you know, you might need an appointment, you might need young people to come into a service. Um, there's no time to really establish that connection or to really understand someone's need. Um, so we found that the spotlight was really on what's happening around the organisational management, the leadership, the governance models, and what the funders had stipulated. And do the funders understand what we want to achieve when we try and prevent and um, get in early for young people who are vulnerable to distress? So concluding thoughts is that maybe the funding models are often based around the treatment-based clinical models of care. And it's like a cookie cutter and we haven't thought deeply enough about 
um, how the models of earlier help seeking need to be quite different. And how do we create the space um, and the empowerment of staff to enable best practice? Because we need to acknowledge that effective practice really does take time because all the things that we found works for young people, including proactive engagement, going out to them, being very flexible, building proper, meaningful, genuine relationships and collaborating with other services and supports. And then also bringing in co-design processes to address like local needs. All of this stuff takes a lot of time. So how about we all um, have a look at how the funding and commissioning environment can start to really actively support best practice. That's all from me. Thank you and over to you, Aurora. Thanks, Lizette. Um, so I'll now briefly introduce all of the panel members who are joining us today, and then we'll move into the panel um, question section of today's webinar. So joining us today, we have Dr. Sarah Youngson, who works as a GP in a rural community in Southwest Western Australia. She has a special interest in youth mental health and is the chair of Blackwood Youth Action, a charity supporting marginalized and at-risk young people in the Southwest. Sarah is also a medical coordinator and senior lecturer for the Rural Clinical School WA and has an interest in rural youth mental health. She's a strong advocate for youth mental health service delivery. With us today, we also have Kelly Clark, a research officer and lived experience lead at CSIUWA. Kelly is a Waramai and Whipple woman who lives and grew up on Wajuk Noongar Budja. She has worked across policy, program, system and service design in a variety of interrelated fields, including housing and homelessness, youth and young people and mental health. Kelly's passionate about bringing lived experience and expertise into all aspects of service and system design delivery and evaluation. We also have with us today, Professor Owen Kalaki, who is Director, and, Director of Research and Head of Functional Recovery in Youth Mental Health at Origin and the Centre for Youth Mental Health at the University of Melbourne. Owen's research is primarily in functional recovery for young people with mental illness, and he's also interested in global models of youth mental health care, as well as evidence-based interventions in mental health and barriers to their implementation. And finally, we have with us Barbara Jordan, who's the engagement manager for Asia Pacific at the Z Zurich Foundation, a Swiss-based charitable foundation established by Zurich Insurance Group to deliver on its global community investment strategy. In her role, Barbara works with Zurich's businesses and their stakeholders across the Asia Pacific region to co-create and fund grant programs with NGOs that drive social impact for vulnerable communities. Mental health, and in particular, the promotion of positive mental health among young people is a key aspect of this work. So following on from hearing about the mental health deep dive research, we thought we'd start with a question for Dr. Sarah Youngson, which is what resonated most with you for mental health deep dive research based on your experience and engagement with the youth mental health space? Thanks so much, Aurora. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge the Bibbulmun people of the Noongar Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land I'm speaking to you from, which is in the southwest corner of Western Australia. Um, in answer to your question, what really resonated with me as a GP and someone that works in the mental health space was that the research clearly articulated the importance of addressing physical, cultural, social, as well as psychological needs. Um, in order that we can best support our young people's mental health. And it also really strongly highlighted the intersection between the social determinants of health and the connections that exist between social disadvantage and mental illness and our need to really address these social inequities. So often in practice, I work with young people whose primary needs are social. Perhaps they're disengaged from school, they've got no income, they may be living in a home where they're exposed to violence, facing so many significant risk factors for developing mental illness. And if we can provide these young people with support to really manage these social determinants, their outcomes are significantly better. And through the research, it started to explore this different model of mental health care service delivery, asking that question, how do we best explore, address all the physical, cultural, social, emotional domains in a cohesive and collaborative manner? 
And the focus of this model just has to be on team-based care where we bring together education and training, employment, housing, community services, along with the mental health services. Um, to quote from the report, focusing greater resources towards prevention, early help, psychosocial and community-based supports makes economic and moral sense. Our young people, those with lived experiences, those of us who are working within the youth mental health sector have been saying for some time that supporting youth mental health, particularly in our young people who are socially disadvantaged, needs to be holistic. And I couldn't agree more with Lizette's summary about what our mental health services need to look like. Our young people need to experience a warm hug. Uh, they need a welcoming place that is inclusive, that's accessible, that has a single entry point with warm handovers, no wrong doors, that is sustainably funded and that's locally driven and managed so that it's contextually appropriate. And it really needs to be able to support our young people before they become mentally unwell with a far greater investment in health promotion, health prevention and early intervention. So this, the findings of this mental health deep dive research really did resonate with me on so many levels. It supported a vision that so many of us working in mental health have. We now have this clear vision. Uh, the challenge is really um, to see it put into action. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. Um, yeah, it's really clear to hear the, the passion that you have for working in this space coming through as well. And um, that takes us to our next question, which is for Kelly. We wanted to ask what drives the work you do in relation to youth mental health? Thanks, Aurora. And yeah, I, it is like such an important question. I think all of us here, like it's worth reflecting on. Um, when you let me know that this was the question that you were going to ask, I was like, oh no, that's fine. I'll be able to answer it on the day. And then realized kind of yesterday that it required a bit more thought because there's lots of reasons that I do this, but it all come, for me, it, it comes down to like young people are people and we should treat them like people. <laughs> um, that when we, when we're treated like people, we get to flourish. Um, and it enables us in turn to treat other people with the dignity that we all inherently have as people. And when we have systems that acknowledge that and don't just acknowledge that, but are built so that we can thrive, then we all do better. And that's, yeah, I really love being able to have input into that and to see other people thrive. So Thanks so much, Kelly. Just having a look and um, I, I think we've got someone who's off mute, and if you don't mind. Um, uh, so, yeah, again, the passion is really clear. And um, as Sarah spoke about, and as Lizette spoke about, we've got this evidence here around what are the thing, what are the challenges, and what things might need to change. So, I wanted to um, next go to Owen with a question. What do you see as the key levers for change in supporting young people's mental health? Uh, me. Thanks, Aurora. Um, and in starting, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, the traditional owners of where I am. Um, a little bit like you, Kelly, I, 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 up until about yesterday, I thought oh, I'd be fine because, you know, this, this whole long list of stuff and I've, I've got some notes, but also listening um, to, to what's, you know, been discussed already. You know, one of one of the, the the important things that I think that has to change is seeing mental health as something that is across every part of our life. Um, it, you know, our treatment systems are based around a, a tiny window where people are, you know, distressed or unwell. But there's all the the period beforehand, and there's the, all the recovery period after afterwards, and we don't integrate those three bits so that you know we wait till people become quite distressed or quite unwell and we give them a small amount of treatment some of which works better than others and then often um, we don't integrate the recovery part and we don't do anywhere near enough particularly in early childhood and I would even go to so far to say 
you know, um, with the, the sort of community and family sort of interventions we could be doing very early. So there's some of the, the, the changes I think we could be making. Um, one of the other things that I think is important, we've just had a, a PhD student who um, found out today she's passed, which is fantastic. But her research was um, in rural Victoria. And one of the things I'm acutely aware of is that many of the solutions that we do come up with are based around urban populations with urban infrastructure, urban workforces, um, and we don't give enough consideration, I think, um, particularly to young people who live outside of that context and, and their needs. Um, and probably the last kind of thing, there's so many things I could say about what might need to change. Um, but one of the things that I thought came up in the, in the report um, was around cultural competency. And I think the other thing that probably needs to change is we need to look at whose understanding of mental health are we working towards? Um, you know, most of the researchers in the world who have looked and described what we should be doing, they look and sound like me. Um, and there are many, many other views about what it is to be mentally healthy. And we need to start including those ways of seeing mental health into what we're aiming towards. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Owen. Um, and I think it, it comes back to, as Sarah touched on as well, the way we look at mental health in terms of all of the social factors that influence that and different cultural understandings um, that look at mental health as responses to life events or lack of resources or um, not having access to community and culture and all of those things. So I think that's a really important point and thank you for um, all of your thoughts today. Um, so the next question we have is for Barbara, and this is how might funders who want to invest in youth mental health support the changes that are needed in this space? Thanks, Aurora, and, uh, and really inspiring to those statements that we've heard beforehand. I can only echo that, you know, the question sounds simple and there's a, there's a lot more to it. Um, finally, uh, first of all, can I say um, congratulations um, to the researchers on this very important piece of work that was established. I, I think it covers a lot of ground. It is, as Lizette said, very broad and um, yeah, very proud to have been part of this process, not just as a funder, but also kind of collaborating um, um, a few steps along the way. So, so thank you for that. And um, maybe what I'd, what I'd like to do first is, is to say kind of what the, the, the foundation's vision is. Uh, it becomes clear to me that um, uh, from the different statements that even in kind of if, if we are sort of in agreement that prevention is important, there's, there's probably different ways to do that. The, the Zetteric Foundation being a global charitable foundation, we have a vision of a world where every young person is supported to take care of their positive mental well-being which is critical in today's world, really, as everyone needs the, the skills to deal with adverse life events, um, as well as with the daily stresses and anxieties, which are ever increasing in a, in a fast moving world, I'd say, with, with plenty of uncertainty. So um, uh, I guess learning about mental health is as critical as learning to read and write. And, uh, and then the question is, how, how can we get there? How can we create that shift? And um, um, what's been mentioned before as well is that prevention has a big potential to also relieve the strain on the treatment facilities um, and on those who provide crisis intervention, making sure that these experts are there for those who need them most and in a timely manner. One of the successful approaches that we're supporting here in Australia uh, together with Zurich Financial Services in Australia is to work with community leaders to be role models and educators when it comes to increasing knowledge uh, on mental health and also um, attitude and behavioural change. So it's that sort of grassroots thing. It's, um, I think it was, was mentioned before, it's, it's um, sharing that knowledge with different communities um, to, to enable 
them to find their own way around mental health. Now, funders, um, more to the question, can play an important role. I can only talk about the perspective, I guess, that we take at um, Zetteric Foundation. They're not the experts. I think that's important to say. They bring a vision of, um, of what positive change could look like and a desire to partner with NGO who have expertise in this field. Um, they actively listen and identify the ways they can add value and, and weigh into the outcomes. And I'd, I'd probably call out um, three things that, that a funder can, can provide. First of all, um, I call it society's risk capital that can, can help bring along new approaches and, and can help put into action some of the recommendations that research suggests um, uh, is, is going in the right direction. With Secondly, with small and large initiatives, um, they can help generate evidence and proof points around um, those approaches. Effective uh, measurement of the impact is key. And, and finally, uh, those proof points help um, to um, help the advocacy efforts, I'd say, in terms of um, talking to governments and institutions. If there's a proven track record of impact for, for some of the approaches, that helps when it comes to changing policies and systems. And every funder has to find that field, I guess, where they can play a, a role in um, advocating for that change. I guess having a proven track record also inspires the confidence and, and can gen generate more, more change. Um, but what's really important is, I think, particularly the mental health crisis is not a crisis that one funder can solve um, on their own, it's, uh, or even governments on their own. I think it has to be a collaboration and, and a joint effort which um, requires alignment. So perhaps the, the last um, aspect of a role of a funder that I call out here is the alignment piece where um, funders often have influence um, to facilitate coalitions and, um, and advocacy efforts. And um, most importantly, to help, help channel funding in one direction. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, and you've touched on a great point around, you know, the um, need for collaboration and that mental health and the challenges that we're seeing are not going to be solved by one individual or one organisation. It's about working together to address those. So um, that brings us to the um, next question that I wanted to open up to the panel. Um, if people want to briefly comment from each of your perspectives on this. And the question is, what kinds of conversations or actions would you like to see happening more around young people's mental health in communities, in healthcare settings, in research or in policy and funding decisions? So um, I might, oh, Kelly's got her hand up. So Kelly, I'll go to you. Yeah, so like, I'd like to see just conversations to begin with. Um, like what if we actually sat down over a cuppa and had a yarn? Um, that building of relationships and then I think the natural question to flow out of it is, how do we build relationship? How do we build relationship with young people between clinicians, between clinicians and managers, between managers and funders, um, and all the way through? That's kind of the main question that I would love to see asked and then worked towards. Like, I, I don't think there's like a clear cut answer. I think it's a, um, a complex answer that requires kind of ongoing input. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I might go next to you, Owen, if you're happy to jump in. Yeah, look, there's, there's a few kind of things. Um, so, look, you know, to have conversations would be a great start. Um, specifically within research, um, you know, there's, there's not currently a way in a research budget to include resources for, particularly for young people to be involved in that research. Um, so that would be a good conversation to have with, you know, funders. Um, it would be also really good, I think, you know, I mean, we, we have obviously in Australia, this kind of multi-level government system 
um, and different levels of government fund different things. Um, whether that's around employment, it, uh, you know, mental health uh, being largely state, but also headspace is a federally funded thing. So conversations about how you can start to link those systems up for people so that they don't have that thing of navigating through different bureaucracies, that they, they just go in one front door and all the back end takes care of the messy business at the back. Um, that kind of conversation would be really, really welcome um, as well. And then finally, you know, um, thinking about how we better involve, and again, just specifically about young people, but young people at the front end of things. So I was really struck, I, I was lucky to visit Foundry, which is a youth mental health service um, in British Columbia. And one of the things that they do there is that the person who welcomes you when you walk in the door is a young person. It's not, you know, um, a clinician or, and they're the ones who find out what you're there for and how they can best direct you to get the services you want. Um, so thinking about how we actually, you know, put that into the, the way that we work um, as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Owen. Um, so I'd just like to encourage people to continue to pop questions in the chat if you have some, and we'll just briefly go to our um, few remaining panellists on this question as well. So um, just briefly, Barbara, are there conversations you would or actions you would like to see happening more that you want to comment on? Thanks, Aurora. I think following on what has already been said, I think there's a really important um, piece, which is working with young people to create outcomes rather than for young people. So not assuming that we know what is best, but really um, be led by them. And, uh, and I think what Kelly touched on was really that connection piece as well. I'd like to see that connection happening more. And, uh, and I guess on an on a ongoing basis, as much as that's possible. Thanks, Barbara. And finally, we'll go to Dr. Sarah Youngson. What are your thoughts on this question? Um, I'd like to have more conversations around the prevention and early intervention space, um, which we've all discussed already today. Just in WA alone, 1% of the mental health budget goes towards prevention. And um, I think that is a huge issue that needs to be addressed. All of us working in the area are just swamped with very unwell people at the moment and there's no capacity to be doing that work. But we need to start looking and making changes around um, working in that prevention space. Um, I noticed a few people are from education and have made comments in the chat and there we have a structure that is could be profoundly effective and um, imp impactful on supporting our young people in that prevention space. So. Um, I think we need to look more at that. Thanks, Sarah. So um, we'll now go to our um, questions from people who've joined us today for the session. And the first one um, from Claire was around, what are your recommendations about overcoming the limitations of funding models that create cookie cutter services. So is there anyone either on the panel or Lizette, if you want to um, join for this question around particular recommendations of how do we overcome those limitations that are currently in place around the you know, short term funding or particular constraints of, fun of lack of funding for the time that's needed to connect with young people? Does anyone want to jump in on that? Lizette, I can see you. Start the ball. I did start to write this in the chat, um, but just the assumption around that treating mental health requires a clinician um, needs to be challenged because I feel like that assumption, um, I mean, it's an important piece in our mental health system, but it's not the only piece. And if you look at that broad understanding of mental health, there's a lot of different um, areas that need intervention and support. That, are, that should be non-clinical because, you know, it's not appropriate for some people and um, it's not um, effective for, you know, depending on what your needs are. Um, so, yeah, we just need to disrupt this assumption that supporting mental health always looks like your traditional sort of treatment style, appointment-based, one-on-one support. 
Yeah, and, and look, I, I would actually add to that that um, in um, sort of mental health in the context of people who are refugees or otherwise displaced, where you know clinical resources are really really scarce and the the, the need is huge. They, they work off of, of sort of a, a pyramid model where the, the clinical resources are just a tiny little bit at the top, um, but they start at the sort of community education kind of level, the broad bit at the bottom where you will put in the, the you know, where you actually can do some stuff around it. And because the, those clinical resources are so scarce, that they, they're they there for the, the, the most severe um, situations that people find them in. And perhaps, you know, we definitely have a, a shortage, a workforce shortage here, but we've, we're probably in that uncomfortable situation where we've got enough that we think that we can do everything with it rather than being forced to be, as you said, disruptive and, and creative to think about what can we be doing at that broader societal level um, for people. Thanks, Simon. Um, Sarah or Kelly, did you have any other comments you'd like to add on that note of how to work, you know, around those current funding restrictions that are impacting on services? Um, I'm just interested in the answers to the question because <laughs> it is a huge barrier to service delivery and, and doing anything in our region in inland southwest. Mm. I, I think, like, Sarah, you guys are doing some great work there. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how you've started to shift some of that. Oh sure. So um, we um, we I'm part of a charity that supports at-risk and marginalised youth with mental health programs in our little community. Um, we have a social enterprise, so we have an op shop. We we are constantly scrounging for funding. Um, we are always looking at innovative programs and um, ways to do the, do the work that we feel is needed in our community. Um, but in terms of getting funding. Uh, that is long term that where we're not competing with other service providers uh, so many of the issues that were raised in this report it's a, it is, is a huge part of our work which should be on providing services um, and I would really love to see government um, looking at smaller organisations that are locally driven that are looking at the context of the individual communities and talking to those people that are actively on the ground and, and I guess providing some flexibility around um, what the services should look like and flexibility around funding. Thanks so much, Sarah. And I might just stick with you for this next question, which is, um, and, and others can jump in as they want to, but there's a question about how COVID affected services during this time and whether more services needed to move online and whether that's effective or a possible option to reach more regional communities. So I wondered um, in terms of your role, whether you might have particular comments on that, and then we'll open it up to others who want to comment. Um, well, we've been um, very, uh, very fortunate where in, in WA and certainly in our area that COVID has had a minimal physical effect on our day-to-day -day work. But of course, all of the young people that we work with have still been impacted on. It's been very interesting with the heightened anxiety and school avoidance, disengagement, just seeing the media and, and all the impacts of that. I'm sure that's well known to everyone. Um, so we haven't had to go to online um, uh, therapy um, but in my experience I feel young people really value a uh, face-to-face uh, connection even though so much of their communication is online and their online friends and so on um, is a very real part of their social world I think having a, a very strong meaningful one-on-one -on -one connection with someone that's not over the telephone is incredibly powerful um, and so I would advocate for continuing face-to-face -face, um, services as much as is practical and, and reasonable. No, and I can see you are nodding as well. So do you want to comment yeah. on that? Look, I am. Um, I, I would I would completely agree with that. You know, it, it, in there's there's an assumption I think that because as you say, young people spend a lot of their time online that that they'd just be well. Of course, I'll just want that. But when you speak to people, they're very, very mixed in their views about it. Um, some people would say yes, and but many, many people say, you know, I actually don't want to do that. I want to be where I can see someone. 
Um, and then the other thing that I, I think is, is, and this kind of gets back to my earlier point, um, online is not always a good solution for regional areas because access to online is really patchy in places. Um, in some places it's non-existent. Um, and, and I think that that really needs to be remembered. Um, this is not an easy solution uh, for our non-urban areas. Thanks so much, John. I can see Kelly, you've got... We also, so in the WA COVID task force for young people, a lot of the concern was around how do you have privacy if you have to be in an online kind of thing? Like if I'm stuck in my house and my predominant social issues are with my family, I can't really freely talk there. It's also another consideration. Absolutely. Um, so I might uh, hop on to another question that was asked around the research. And um, there are a couple of connected questions. So one was, um, Lizette, you might want to comment on this one, what types of organisations were involved in the research? And another question was, were young people involved? So I wondered if you wanted to comment on that and maybe answer both of those. Sure, um, you can find out all the details in the reports, but um, from memory, the stakeholders we engaged were um, representing peak bodies, um, Office of the Chief Psychiatrist, um, some people working for NGOs, um, such as Sarah, um, in like regional areas, um, people all across the states and territories, um, and but no, we did not involve young people um, because of um, we didn't have time to get the ethics clearances for that. Um, but yeah, that is um, something we we didn't do. Kelly, would you like to? On, yeah, so on the ethics thing, so engaging young people was one hundred percent my preference. Like as the lived experience lead, it's kind of my jam. But um, like the university ethics clearance was part of it but then also just the time we had um like to do this kind of work properly you need a lot of time um to like really engage with people and build trust and that kind of thing and like I would have wanted to take a couple of years with it <laughs> um <laughs> which is just my preference like that's but doing it properly is really important um that said, I think we got some really neat insights from those high level stakeholders that often aren't engaged. Like they were very high level stakeholders, whereas often when non-lived experience is engaged, it's service managers. And I think that that difference of having kind of the very high level folks involved gave us insights that we may not have got otherwise. Thanks, Lizette and Kelly. Um, so we did have another question around um, the importance of supporting families and young people as well. And I know a couple of panelists have touched on this um, and it was around, you know, what are, the, what are potentially the effective models for funding that kind of support of children and families. And I know that our um, report on effective and promising practice with young people does touch on this a little bit. And we talk about um, providing universal services that you know anyone can access. So really limiting the um, barriers to entry for anyone, but targeting funding to make sure that the communities who might um, you know not have enough support in their area can really um, benefit from that. And also that services can be designed and informed by local experiences as well. So I just wanted, does anyone else particularly want to comment on um, the question around funding models for supporting families as well as young people? If nothing comes to mind, I've got another question that I might go to for the panel. Um, so I would just encourage the person who asked the question around families um, to perhaps look at the uh, the report on effective and promising practice with young people, you'll find a little bit of information in there. Um, and what we might do just to wrap up is to go back to the panel. Um, so uh, around 
what are your final thoughts on this topic that you'd like to end the panel discussion with? Is there something we wish you'd asked you that you didn't get to talk about yet? So um, to begin with, I might go to Owen first up. Owen, if you've got some thoughts you'd like to finish with. Um, one of the things that I can't remember at some point in this last hour um, just occurred to me um, that we sometimes overlook in these conversations is just the need to take the concerns of young people seriously. I, I was listening to a young man the other day talking about his absolute terror about climate change um, and how that was impacted by the, um, the, 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 the callousness, as he saw it, of our leaders um, and, and the things that are happening in that way. And this is something that's, you know, magnified across you know if, if you're young and you're sort of worried that there won't be a future for you that's that's true and but i don't think that that gets taken seriously as a mental health issue of young people and i think there's a, a range of issues like that so taking those issues seriously i think would be um, really important thanks on um and next I'll, I'll go to barbara you've got your hand up barbara yes um Owen, Owen just inspired that that thought as well, kind of building on it. I, I think the, it's been mentioned before that you know social inequities um, build um, mental well uh, negative me mental well being, and there's a close um, interaction there, um, vice versa. But um, that sense of agency that um, Owen touched on, I think that's really important. And looking at mental well being and, and building that. That muscle, that that positive mental well-being, is is really very closely linked to um, self-efficacy, to agency, to to self-esteem as well. And and if we can achieve um, a, a good um, a good mix of all those skills, I think that that will be a major step forward. Thanks, Barbara. Um, so Sarah, I might go to you next. Um, what would you like to say that we haven't asked you about? Uh, I'd just like to say thanks for continuing on this um, journey of discovery and, and reporting because I think it's really, really important that these sort of um, documents are produced and that I know that mental health uh, service reform is, is a huge thing and it's overwhelming and we can all become quite despondent over it but I think we've got to just keep um, having these conversations and it's, I just thank you for the opportunity. Thanks Sarah and to Kelly. I want to thank the team and so like everyone from Z Zurich, the people at CSI and also the people who participated in our research like we got some amazing insights going through that design process really listening to people and I think the fact that we were able to listen and adjust what we were doing, that we built adjusting what we were doing into how we approached it um, is a testament to the bravery of Zurich letting us do that. And therefore a model of how other funders can also approach anything to do with mental health. Yeah. Thanks so much, Kelly. And Lizette, did you have any final thoughts you wanted to share as well? Um, thanks, Aurora. I just it took a while for my brain to kick into gear, but just on the question of um, supporting families around young people, um, I've been working with lived experience experts this year and just um, the need for the model to expand. So it's just not all about the individual because individuals are within families and families are within communities. And so again, expanding out from the assumptions of the treatment model to um, have the gaze widened and you know, look at the ecosystem around people is um, something that we need to get more creative about. And apart from that, I echo all your thoughts about thank you so much for the opportunity to have a discussion. It's really interesting. Thanks, Lizette. Um, and I'd just like to, again, um, echo that thank you as well. We really appreciate you all joining us here today. And we really appreciate all of our panel members for being part of this discussion and generously sharing your expertise and experience 
it's been a real pleasure and I do apologize if there are any questions that we missed as a few came in towards the end, but if you'd like more information, please feel free to check out the mental health deep dive reports um, or keep in touch with us. Um, and again, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure and we really appreciate you being here. Thank you.